So I'm gonna go ahead and just speak with my loud mouth instead of getting on the mics, uh, but I'm really excited to introduce our next talkers. My name is uh, Kevin May from the Catholic University of uh, America in Washington, D.C., the Bush School of Business. Uh, I'm a professor of innovation and technology management. I'm helping run the finance track at the uh, conference. I'm really excited to uh, continue to let the conversation begin so we can connect the dots. Uh, I don't know about you, I've been really blown away so far. We were just talking about it. It's been really impressive. Um, you, won't, you may not be shocked to hear we're actually uh, being prayed for. Uh, we mailed out a prayer request to exactly 100 religious orders, uh, cloisters, and monasteries asking for their prayers. And I, I really think those prayers have been answered. This has been a fantastic start to the um, uh, conference, in my humble opinion. Uh, and uh, uh, and t t that excitement continues uh, as we're going to learn about crypto taxes uh, for all the money we're going to be making, right? So uh, the topic today is Crypto Tax 101, what you need to know. Uh, and on stage with us is uh, David Spencer, CPA from DKS LLC, and uh, Kirk Phillips, CPA, CMA, CFA, CPB, and a whole alphabet soup I'm probably forgetting. Um, they're going to be talking about the focus for financial gain from cryptocurrency uh, could make it really easy to forget about the tax man, uh, but pay taxes we must indeed. Uh, failure to understand and abide by tax laws associated with cri cryptocurrency could be perilous. Uh, in the presentation, David Spencer provides an overview of the basics of taxation and, and crypto and how to avoid costly mistakes. Uh, so David's a CPA. He's a graduate of the University of Oregon's Charles H. Lundquist College of Business. He's a founding oh, member of the Oregon Business Consulting Group management team. Uh, David was a recipient of the coveted uh, Nuhadu. Uh, I hope I said that right. Yeah, you did. All you right, fantastic. Uh, Nuhadu School of Business International Exchange Internship. Uh, the opportunity landed him in Beijing, China, where he worked for uh, Globebill, a cross-border payment provider in the Asian market. Uh, David began his work as a CPA in Portland, Oregon, focusing on high net worth clients and closely held entities, as well as succession planning. In 2018, he joined an accounting firm in Florida before establishing DKS, uh, the firm uh, he leads today. David discovered cryptocurrency in 2015 and recognized its potential as an easy to use, cutting edge technology. And as an early adopter of the technology, David made cryptocurrency uh, one of his practice's specialties. Uh, Kirk uh, Phillips uh, is the founder of CryptoBullseye.club, which is trademark, so don't try and take it. <laughs> the ultimate uh, crypto resource and crypto coaching. He's also involved with numerous other startups and is the author of the Ultimate Bitcoin Business Guide, the AICPA Blockchain Fundamentals Course, uh, Luca Library White Papers, Coindesk articles, and numerous other publications. He's a member of the AICPA Virtual Currency Task Force and regularly speaks and educates CPAs and attorneys about the crypto and blockchain space. He's also a BitAngels Philadelphia city leader and a self-proclaimed uh, uh, DeFi degen. So, DeGen, <laughs> my apologies. So excited to hear y'all speak and uh, thank uh, you. take it away. Appreciate it. Kurt, thank you for joining us here. We've got a um, we'll tell our audience here first what a DeFi DGIN is, yeah, right? Yeah, great, great so place to start, yeah. DeFi <laughs> is decentralized finance. We currently live in the world of centralized finance. We have banks who take care of things for us. And so if you're uh, into DeFi, you're in decentralized finance. And we call them degenerates because they are risk takers, which is kind <laughs> of uncharacteristic for an accountant, right? Um, so Kurt, Kurt's going to tell us a little bit about what's going on with the tax space and crypto. So most yeah. people are still confused. Do I have to pay taxes on my crypto? What do you think? Yeah, great, great way to start. Thanks. It's a pleasure being on stage with you. And uh, it's interesting with the degenerate thing because it's got a sort of a negative connotation to it. But actually, on the flip side, it's actually a, a cool thing to have if you want to call it. I think it is. Yeah, <laughs> like me too, DJ, man. So anyway, um, yeah, it's interesting how... Uh, I think in the early days, people thought, oh, wow, maybe there's a magic wand. This thing, is, this thing will give me like a free pass because, you know, my Bitcoin transactions won't be taxable and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, but as it turns out, it's really like, if you look at the economics of it, the economics of whatever that you're doing mm -hmm. and whatever jurisdiction it is, there's already going to be regulations that apply by default. Yes. So, right? And so. you know what? I, I love the word you used because you have to have a methodology, right? And if you approach it with a methodology, it's just like anything else, right? You, if you're running a business, you've got your books that come in every, every, week, every month, you're gonna close the books, right? And we're not gonna do anything different in crypto. We have rules that already work for us, right? So we're gonna apply the rules we already have and, and calculate the tax that way. Now, one of the things that uh, is often a question in the, in the taxation space for digital assets is how do we actually do it? So 
We use software to, to do these calculations. If you're doing 10, 20,000 transactions in a year, we're gonna use a, a number of different kinds of software probably to do those calculations. At my firm, we use a, a service called Zen Ledger. You can always use that yourself if you're feeling so confident. But is there a type of software that you think is uh, we working well for you in the marketplace? Yeah, that's that's a great question. When I find, when I'm at these talks, I always find that's that's an, the inevitable question. If somebody wants to know what's the best software, mm -hmm. or even clients, they want to know what's the best software. That's interesting. You you found one that maybe you're gravitating around. But what I found is that first of all, uh, and this is also talking to CPA firms that yeah. are like like bigger ones that want to get into the space because when they're using other software it's like the firm will adopt the software for whatever the thing is. Like if it's regular tax so software, not crypto, just regular tax, they're gonna have one software that they use for all the clients. Right. So they would obviously wanna do it here, mm -hmm. but what you could have is some clients may come with, they may have already used the software. Mm -hmm. They come to you with the software. Um, so that's one scenario. Um, at, but I, I've actually found that, I wouldn't say there's actually one go-to one. And with all due respect to my fellow uh, crypto tax service providers, but I think they've all got challenges. Yes, they've all got issues, and a lot of a lot of times it's kind of like it's a bit like what's the lesser of the evils, and uh, but like which one best fits the situation because everybody's mm -hmm. got a unique situation. Yeah, is the tooling on ABC does that work best for the client? How do do you, yeah. do you find that as well? You definitely have to use the whatever tool is best, right? One of the reasons I like the software I use is because it gives me the ability to make changes. At the end of the day, it's the intent of the taxpayer, right? If you buy and sell something, right, that's a pretty easy calculation. Where it gets more tricky is when you're running a business. Is anybody in here mining digital assets? How many, let's, yeah, we got some miners in here. How many people in here have purchased digital assets before? Okay, so we've got a pretty seasoned group. All of you guys are gonna have to pay taxes. I hate to break it to you, <laughs> okay? And one of the common myths that we, common misconceptions that I like to talk about is I, maybe I don't have to pay taxes until I get back to cash. Have you heard that before? Oh, absolutely. That's a common one, yeah. that's not the case. So let's kind of walk ourselves through a common transaction flow, all right? I take my uh, bank account, I connect it to Coinbase, all right? I buy some digital assets, buy some Ethereum on Coinbase, okay? If that Ethereum sits there and it goes to 5,000 and back down, I don't have any questions yet. I don't have a tax problem to just even discuss. Unrealized gains. It's just unrealized moving up gains. and down. Paper, paper gains, paper up and gains. down, up and down. If I take that Ethereum and I buy it for $1,000 and it goes up to $2,000 and then I sell out of it, now I have something I need to calculate, okay? So on that $1,000 gain, I'm gonna have to pay tax. Now here's the $100 million question. I'm gonna give it to him because I, I, there's a two parts to it, right? So what's the tax rate on my short-term capital gains? Short-term capital gains is gonna be actually whatever your marginal tax rate is, which is just, they say, oh, well, what's marginal tax rate? I keep hearing that word. It's just whatever your highest tax rate is because we have a graduated tax system, right? Mm -hmm. It goes up from you know, uh, a small rate and it goes all up to whatever the highest rate is. So your marginal rate is whatever your high water mark is. That's yeah. like your high water mark tax rate. Exactly. So short term is always whatever that is for you. So really short term doesn't have any distinction. Exactly, right? it's your ordinary income, right? Yeah. That's, what we're, that's the, the point there. Now, is there something different if I hold it for more than a year? Yeah, what greater than a year is gonna be long term rates. Mm -hmm. Which and is then, another, it depends, right? Because yeah. it depends on what your income was in the prior year, right? Zero, 15, and 20 is what we got that, now, right? Yeah, that's right? So under, for a married couple, under 80 grand, you've got long-term capital gains, you're gonna pay 0%. I, it's very rare when I get to tell a client Super rare, that, yeah. Right, it's very rare. But it is possible, but it's, actually. I've had it happen a couple times. If you, designed the best crypto, conversation. if you designed your crypto enough and then you just took profits to that degree, you could pay 0% tax. You could try so, it, you could do it. 80, 80 grand total, income right? Or 80 grand income, right? So that adjust AGI number is right, and so that's see that's the face they like. They would have that. Wait, how do we calculate it? Oh yeah, okay, well, yeah, me and her together we made more than that. So that's what, right? So that's a problem there. Between 80 and like 300, we're gonna be about 15. Uh, yeah, may, yeah, three something and like some that. High threes or maybe it's four. I don't know, somewhere. Yeah, so it's it's pretty in high between number, three and actually. four. If you get there, we'll talk about it, right? And Above by the way, that, those numbers change all the time, so there's no need to like lock in, like correct. what numbers are. It would be a, a, it would be a waste of a CPA's brain to thank you remember that stuff. And, and that's why we don't <laughs> keep those numbers in our heads, right? They're always changing, mm -hmm. often changing. Above that 300, 
above a $450,000 mark. We're, yeah. we're paying 20% on long-term capital gains, okay? And you can, you can go get the exact number, IRS website, long-term capital gains, it's right there, right? So that's our short-term, our long-term capital gains. But what if I'm mining, right? What is, what is my basis in that asset? If you're mining, your basis in the asset, it's income at the time it was received, okay? So at the time it was received. So we're gonna go directly to the blockchain, wherever your uh, miner is depositing your assets to, and I'm gonna get that report, and I'm gonna know the value of the digital asset at the time you received it. Is that how you guys do it? Exactly, yeah, you're gonna look at that. I mean, the miners probably have an address set up for, maybe it could be more than one, but they got their, mm -hmm. their re mining revenue address, and so right. all those Bitcoin, you know, mining rewards are gonna go into that address, so you could just pull a timestamp, whether it's whatever the frequency is, yep. that's how you're gonna pick your, your income up, which is a great, a super excellent point here while you're on timestamps, because this is something that, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I don't wanna throw in. We're here for all the questions. Dominion you and wanna, control? Yeah. Yeah, dominion and control. <laughs> so the answer to the question is when you have dominion and control. So we'll, I often like to use non-crypto examples, right? So let's say you receive a check from a client at dinner on New Year's Eve, right? The banks are closed. You can't deposit it in the bank. You, I mean, you go to ATM, right? But banks are closed. It's a big check. You don't want to put it in the ATM. Um, and which tax year does that fall in? That falls in the current, the 1231 tax year because you had control yeah. of that asset. So the question then lies, when did you have control of that asset? Did you have the ability to send it to your wallet or were you waiting on another party to send it to your wallet? Do you have the ability to change when that that That's right. happens, right? So the question is, dominion, the answer is dominion and control. It's a lo long-standing doctrine that you can apply mm -hmm. in these other situations. Plus, it's also more practical from a software uh, perspective because, it's you, again, you got that one time stamp every two weeks. That picks it up. I mean, it's, it's also like making more work yeah. because you got to do a workaround on the software if you're mm -hmm. going to try to pick up if it was a daily earned reward or whatever it is. So. And it, it, depending on the price of the asset, that could be work that is worse. So you do a cost benefit analysis. So think about this. Um, I'm working with a client there. They calculate their revenue at the end of the month. With they, that's the month, that's what they use they, before they met me. Okay, before they met me. They were calculating at the end of the month, we had this many Ethereum come in. So this is our how much money we made that month. But the price of Ethereum can change wildly over the course of a month, right? And so I deliver to them a printout of what day, you know, you use a closing price at the end of the day if you don't have the timestamp. The best thing is a closing price at the end of the day. But you still gotta find an easy way to integrate that. And so knowing I'm kind of a techie guy myself, I'm kind of a nerd, right? And so understanding really how to go do research on the blockchain, that's kind of the difference. You know, accountants, we kind of know how to do that. And that's kind of what sets us apart, that we can get the information to make sure that we're you're good, getting. We're good, we're good information gatherers. <laughs> that's what sets us apart, true story. So details, dominion details. and control is the answer to that one. Yeah, so while we're on that point, this is a really important, we could just, let's just take this whole timestamp receiving thing mm -hmm. and just extrapolate that or look at like, what are the other events, right? Because we got, we've got just receiving crypto for services, we've got airdrops. airdrops, and we've got a whole wide range of different things that can mm -hmm. happen. So really, the, the, the key takeaway here is Pay attention to that timestamp, especially on stuff like maybe yeah. one-off stuff like an airdrop, mm -hmm. because you can get burned because you have to pick up income on that day. And you know, for those in crypto, if you've been in it long enough, you know that oftentimes there's hype around mm -hmm. the things, and it's super hot when things land the day that stuff comes out or whatever, and it could it could just fall off a cliff in a day, yeah. a week, yeah. right? 
Yeah, and it's so painful when it falls off a cliff the next year. So a common, a common example is you have a digital asset, you're at near the end of the year, you sell the digital asset, right? So you've got this big gain, and then before you, you oftentimes people will take a lot of that gain and they will reinvest it, right? Yep. They reinvest that gain in an asset that then goes down. Oh, he's, I think you've heard this story before. Yeah, okay, and now you don't have the money to pay the tax. That's what you call, everybody heard, uh, have everybody heard the term getting wrecked? Get wrecked. R-E-K-T, getting mm -hmm. wrecked. Get That's wrecked. what I call, it's a special kind of wreck. It's <laughs> called getting tax wrecked. <laughs> That's what happened. Because, because an airdrop or mining is not, when you sell it, you count the gain. It's the moment that it's deposited. Is that what you're saying? So two, those are two different things, though, mining and an airdrop, right? So an airdrop is Let's income. explain basis too. Can you explain yes. income and basis? Because they're right. that's a little bit of a tricky thing. It would so income is money received, right? The basis in an asset is what you paid for it, right? You don't have a basis in an airdrop, and therefore that the diff we're just calculating the difference between what your basis is and what it is at the time you receive it. Hopefully, if you get an airdrop, it's worth nothing when you receive it. Right, that's what you really hope that it's worth nothing, and then it goes up, right? Um, so that could be it could be zero, it could, could be another be. number. But like, say for instance, you, say you're providing ser consulting services, somebody pays you five thousand dollars in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. In that case, you have simultaneously five thousand dollars of income, and your basis is now five thousand dollars because it's as if they paid you in dollars, and you instantaneously went and just bought the Bitcoin for exactly and had that's a five thousand dollar basis, right? So yeah, what he said. Here they come. Here we go. Right here, and they'll come right here. Yep. Yeah, so if I'm part of the project and, and then six months later I get uh, an airdrop of, say, it's worth 10 grand, but I was not anticipating any airdrop from said project, mm -hmm. I'm not liable for that income. I, I, I mean, it's like anyone can send anything to any wallet at any time. Happens all the time. I would yeah. say it's more it's more more likely yes. I mean, we're also talking about unsolicited property too. Yeah, you know, because that's so, yeah. It's, it, it's kind of like it's kind of like property. I went to sleep and then a red brick showed up inside my wall and I didn't even know it was there. Sometimes they're gold bricks. Mm -hmm. A lot of times airdrops are red bricks, right. not worth much. But so your best option is to burn it, right? So if you if somebody sends you an asset that you don't want. You have evidence that it came to you from an address unknown. It comes into your wallet. You can have, you, some people would say don't touch it, don't click on it, don't do anything, because maybe the click on it is the trap, right? So there's danger in that. But the other option is to burn it. And if you send it to a burn wallet, all zeros dead at the end, right, a burn wallet, then you will also have evidence that you have abandoned that asset, right? Mm -hmm. And so you received an asset, you abandoned an asset, it's a wash, also, I think the, the likelihood of you having one of those of substantial value where it's like a, like a let's, so ERC-20. If you get one, send it me. <laughs> yeah, we'll take care of it for you. Uh, yeah. So. Oh, yeah. A Zoom wallet? Right. And yeah. then the way that you get involved, and I, I won't take too much time, but mm -hmm. you have to have a trust link yep. to get access to those projects. Mm -hmm. So I, in, the, in the midst of it, you know, I, so I have these things. Yeah. Like Songbird. So you want, yeah, uh, Songbird. Yeah, I even sent that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so you go, you, six months go by, and I'm focused on Bitcoin, Ethereum, other projects. I check my Zoom wallet, and I have $30,000 worth of five different tokens that I never even Do you well, really want to burn it? <laughs> you can send it to me. I will gladly take it. Okay. I mean, yeah, we're, we're just one thing is we're kind of getting into the weeds on a little more complicated stuff. But let yeah. me, if I just want to throw some additional color commentary in here on this one, because this is, 
again, this is, uh, first of all, we're navigating in a world where we still have gray areas, even though we do know sure. a lot of what, the, we, we know that the rules of property taxation apply Correct. here, right? But anyway, so we want to talk about unsolicited property. That's what this is, mm -hmm. I, I think it is. So just to give you a, a, just to give you a court case to show you that it's also not black and white here. So there was a case where uh, there was a, a book reviewer and of course, this we're talking like, I don't even know how old this case, decades ago. The book reviewer would get books. Yeah. Because when you're a book reviewer, of course, people are gonna send you books because they want you to review it and give a good review. So the guy would get books all the time. That's like unsolicited property. So he would just put them on a shelf, okay? And then one day, one year, he's like, mm, you know what? I think I wanna take a charitable deduction. So he went and takes them to, uh, uh, I don't know where he, he, he donated the book somewhere mm -hmm. for some value. Yeah. Goodwill or whatever it is, he got a re, you know got a receipt, yeah. and therefore he took a deduction on his tax return for these books. Mm -hmm. So possession doesn't always mean dominion and control or acceptance of that property. In that particular mm. case, that's what that case demonstrated, because he had possession, then the books were on his shelf, but the dominion and control didn't happen until the moment that he filed the tax return and took a charitable deduction. Mm. He lost that case, and said that he had to pick up income for those books. Okay, that's kind of what at I was At the same thinking. time, he took the deduction. So he had the expense, the deduction right. piece, that's but he should have put the income, to, you yeah, see? That's when they wanted the income. So possession doesn't necessarily mean mm -hmm. the income. Dominion so that's what I'm saying, you gotta dig deeper. But this is yeah. good. We're kind of getting a little more complex. Well, well I, like, I like this question, because I'm an XRP believer too, right? <laughs> and, and so what happened there is XRP had um, a number of other different projects that said, if you own XRP, then we're gonna, because we like XRP, we're gonna gift to you some of our token, right? And so that's the airdrop and Songbird. It was several different tokens that that happened with. Yeah, we gotta um, talk about this. Like, yeah, it's, it's a good XRP. one, right? Once you kind I'll of paying attention on this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's a good question. If that's not an insignificant amount, sixty, seventy thousand dollars, it's not insignificant on your tax return. And I mean, I'm a tax planner, so we plan tax returns a year, two years ahead of time sometimes, right? And so if that throws a monkey wrench in your plan, right? Um, so it's not, I'd, I'd hate to joke, because it's not a simple problem at all. Uh, and the, the, the first thought is send it to a dead wallet. If you really don't want the assets, send it to a dead wallet. Charitable donation is also another good planning strategy, right? So you can look at it from a couple different perspectives. Um, but from just a, from a blockchain solution standpoint, send it to a dead wallet if you really don't want the assets. Um, right next to him, too, though. What, no, up, up here we had the professor, and then right next to him. Yeah. I, I'm supposed to be keeping the trains running on time, so I'm sorry to contribute here, but um, let's say you go to a concert and they do an airdrop. Can you use the cost basis as like a ticket to the concert, or is it like it's just a total accidental thing? Yeah, that seems, that seems, I mean, it'd probably be like a materiality question then, you know, how much was the ticket, right, and how much did it go up to? If that, if that airdrop yeah. went up to something Got big, it. then, you know. And then when you said you use the closing price, how do you have a closing price on a 24-7 asset? What's the source of truth there? Is it at midnight? Midnight. Or? Okay. Zero, 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 yeah, zero. You can, yeah, I mean, if you go to your coin market caps of the world, they list historical yeah, prices, like high, low, yeah. open, and close, and you okay. can find those numbers. But I just wanted to go back to something you were talking about earlier that was really important. You were talking about the... The Coinbase scenario, you just start off, get your oh, Coinbase yeah. account, link to bank account, buy the ETH, and then you later sell it? Yes. So the thing is, is because we got, let's just create two scenarios for selling the ETH. Mm -hmm. One is back to US dollars, Yep. and the other is you trade ETH for Bitcoin. Yes. So what happens in both of those cases? Okay, so let's say let's we- Let's say the numbers are the same. Numbers are the same, let's, let's refresh. We bought Ethereum for $1,000, it went up to $2,000, we sold it, okay? Then I take that $2,000 I have and I buy Bitcoin with it, right? I've got a, a, a gain to pay tax on, on that $1,000, right? But wait a minute, David, I never got back to cash yet. It never made it back into my, my bank account, so I don't have the cash to pay the tax because I bought $2,000 worth of Bitcoin and it went down to $500 worth of Bitcoin, so I don't have the cash to pay the tax on the money that I just, right? So that's a common problem because you do have to pay tax even if you don't make it back to cash. Right, it's, it seems like, we were bringing that up because it seems like this would be, the dust would have cleared on this one, but it still appears to show up that people think that, so basically whenever there's a disposal, it doesn't matter what the other asset, it doesn't matter whether it's fiat, USD, mm -hmm. or another crypto, it and doesn't matter, it's a disposal took place. Mm -hmm. and Go right here.
$1,500 loss, netting process, you have a net, net $500 loss, correct. If, they sell the Bitcoin. if, if you, you sell, sell the Bitcoin, yeah. correct, right. yeah. Yeah. Um, Just to that real quick though, there's mm -hmm. no washout rule, right? Couldn't you sell it and buy it back right away? Yeah, you can, there's no, like stock where you have to wait like 90 days or no wash rule yet, okay. correct, right. right. That was actually going to be my question, like yep. if tax are you know, the easiest of selling it and you guys buying back. Right? Yeah, for the time being, we just don't have a rule yet. Um, we were just listening to, the, to uh, Michelle speak about um, the regulation is coming, and it's coming pretty quickly. It's most quickly. likely going to come. It's I mean, coming. So, if you look at, like I was, I was saying the other day, like if you look at the, if you look at the way, let's say traders or anybody uses uh, trading platforms, centralized exchanges. If you're looking over their shoulder, it basically it looks the same as it does, and for securities, I mean, yeah. it's the same. They order books and everything else is mm -hmm. the same. So you think the IRS is going to let Ross rules, rules apply to securities, and it's just a definition? Is all we got to do is say for purposes of the Ross rule. Yeah digital assets are, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, that's all you gotta do so. is change a little definition. So. And so thinking about that example all the way through as well, when, when we have digital assets and they're gonna, so I buy the Ethereum, it goes up, um, I, go into, uh, some, I go into something on Uniswap, right? I buy an asset there, it's two grand, it goes up to 50 grand, I sell it back into the Ethereum, right? That's my, that, that difference is my tax, because basis is what I paid for it, right? And then I sell it at my gain, and then often what happens, we saw this happen back here, when you sell it into a third asset, people, I made a bunch of money now, and then they, that asset goes down, now you have a tax problem, right? You get, because you, you get, still have to correct. pay You get tax. super burned, mm -hmm. big time burned on that. So right. that's basically, basically what it means, you, you end up with a situation where you have the tax liability, or the, ta the taxable, tax liability and or taxable income mm -hmm. is greater than the value of your assets. Correct. And so that's mm -hmm. like worst case. And it does happen. People get wrecked big Often. time on this. Often. So mm -hmm. somebody had a question. So you're only, but that, that only applies close to the end of the year, right? Because if you bought into the, the asset and it went up, but then let's say that crashed, mm -hmm. if it crashed in the same year, you could show a loss, right? If, yeah, if you dispose of it. Yeah, if you have a lot, if you, if you hold it, you don't, if you're holding the asset, if you're a hodler and you, all you do is dollar cost average into Bitcoin, which is a really good plan, I think, still, especially at the prices we're at now, if you're dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin and you're a hodler, you're in good shape. You don't have any tax events, you don't have any tax liabilities, right, because there's a difference between those. Um, you're in good shape. It's, it's the traders and the DGENs and those guys, right, and those guys, I'm, I'm one of them too. I've been, you know, because you have to kind of pay tuition to learn in this space, right? You, Absolutely, hundred percent. You got to pay 100%. tuition. That's getting in there, getting your hands dirty, pay losing some dues. money. Yeah, <laughs> pay your dues, lose some money, get scammed. I've been scammed, <laughs> right? Right. So, and it's all part of learning. I think that's what gives yeah, me a and, unique. Uh, and the point David's trying to make too is you got to pay attention to where you got your loss. You got a giant gain, and all of a sudden you got a loss just hanging around, lingering, just waiting for you. you like turn it into a realized loss. Mm -hmm. And that's where we talk about. Don't tax miss the planning. opportunity when you have a loss that's otherwise sitting there. Take advantage of Take it. Take advantage of it. Right here. I, I had that situation. I, I had something that I made in June of 15 a.m., which in my head is something that makes no sense until I thought to myself, oh my God, what time did I look at validator? That's a great one, That's a good one, Jack. Well, first of all, what I would say is <laughs> next time, give yourself some more lead time, first of all. So. Yeah. Yeah. So his advice is best: get a um, give yourself a little bit more lead time. But that's a really good question. I, I think I think it's it's possible you could justify that. Yeah. I you mean, know, intent of the taxpayer. Yeah. My intent was, and mm -hmm. I mean, how do you document it? Well, I this mean, is you probably I didn't take a screenshot, which you should take screenshots, by the way, for certain 
things. But you know, documented in a memo that this is what I did, and this uh, timestamp showed up and stuff like that. But and I, yeah. I was mentioning a word you had said earlier, the economics of the situation. I kind of forgot what I was thinking. But one of the things I harp on my staff is using a reasonable method, consistently applied, that accurately uh -huh. represents the economics of the situation. You got it. That's that's right there. That's a golden nugget right, right? there. I'll give it to you one more reasonable time. Reasonable and consistent. You know, reasonable reasonable method, and consistent. consistently applied, that accurately represents the economics of the situation. And what, what that does is the economics of what happens, that's what I'm trying to present, right? You're my, if you're my client, I want to make sure that I'm like a referee, right? I'm not on the side of the IRS and I lean on your side just a little bit. Okay, because I want to make sure that they're following the rules, you're following the rules, and that anything that I can use to your advantage, I will, right? If there's a rule that works to your advantage, I absolutely will, right? So we're kind of like a referee, but we lean towards the client, right? And so I like that way to think about it, the economics of the situation. If you can, can, if you can communicate to me the economics of the situation and support it with some documents or something I can go find, you're probably going to be all right. Yep, that's another good one. Yeah, whenever you have any one-off obscure situations, whatever that is, take screenshots. That's, I actually take screenshots feverishly. About, I almost, I'm almost making my own user manual when I'm taking <laughs> screenshots and stuff, which I actually have used to construct going back on taxes when Thanks. I needed to, you know, it was like my reference point to actually figure stuff out. But mm -hmm. whenever you have a one-off situation, it could be an airdrop or just, I mean, you name it. Something that's unusual, document, document, document. Screenshots could be your friend because sometimes if you don't get a screenshot in a moment, you might never be able to get that one again. Mm -hmm. Add a memo to it, whatever it is. It could be links to articles about a certain thing, like when did an airdrop happen, the date of an airdrop, mm -hmm. and stuff like mm -hmm. that, because it could be that on a certain date, maybe you had to pick up income, whereas another one, maybe you had a zero basis or whatever. But just document the one-off stuff. Don't go on memory. At all. That's not your, memory's not your friend. And feel free to send it to your accountant even if it's not tax season yet, right? Because we got a file with your name on it. If you send it to me, I can just put it in the file and it'll be there when like tax season gets here. <laughs> so feel free. We got one over here and then right there. Go for it. With, with the providers, you know, you get like mm -hmm. Yeah. That's income. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there's long-term capital gains. Short-term capital gains are ordinary income. Long-term capital gains do get preferential treatment. But I'm gonna give you a, a question that I had on um, one of the exams. It was a, a, one of the capstone courses at the University of Oregon where I went to school at, go Ducks. Um, the question is, if you find a $100 bill on the ground in the park, do you have to pay tax? Any guesses? The answer is yes, okay? If you get a nickel, okay, the government wants one of those pennies, okay? <laughs> right? So that's, that's kind of the, the way you really should look at it. If you made some money that wasn't in your pocket and now it is, the government wants a piece of it. Because whether that's right, wrong, or indifferent, we could talk about that all day. <laughs> that's, a different, that's a different whole Yeah, I mean, other, other than disposals, the, the systematic thing that we all know about is the trading, the disposals. Mm -hmm. Right? We all get that that's long or short-term capital gains. It's all these other events and things that have. So that's likely going to be uh, ordinary income stuff. Mm -hmm. I treat staking so. kind of like interest income. Yeah. Yeah. Put it on the, you know, their line seven, other income. It's, yeah, that's but other like income. All that stuff is other income. Mm -hmm. I know you called something else, but just to follow yeah. on that, so let's say you're staking and it's one of these things that gets shut down. Like maybe an idiot professor left an urn on Gemini mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. he thought that was good to go and that they weren't part of the contagion and now it's frozen. If that never comes back to that person, is that a law? Your basis was what you bought it for, and your proceeds were zero. Okay. Yeah. Right here. So, you know, I know that you guys are, are, are CPAs and, and, and... He's got way more letters than me, so <laughs> just... <laughs> He's smarter than me. Person. No, I'm just better looking. <laughs> Uh, well, for, in that particular case, I'm your guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I live in Tampa. 
Yeah. Well, how about that? It actually worked out well. Yeah, that worked out. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> There's your geographic solution. Right. If you're not him, <laughs> you don't live in Tampa, find a CPA you like. If you, do you work with other folks' CPAs often? Uh, yeah, we work with CPAs. Actually, I mean, actually, most of the clients we have are not. They're from all around the country, people I've never even met before face-to-face. -face, so. yeah. And I know that that's a common thing that people like, if, especially if that's what they've yeah. You know, that's what they've known and they're used to. But I mean, I think it's, it's actually more about am I getting the right person in the right relationship? Mm -hmm. And geography doesn't really have anything to do with it in my mind, especially with something that's niche like this, because there's still, mean, yeah. yeah, there's still really a handful of people. There's maybe 50, 50 of us. It's really a handful of people. <laughs> yeah, that was being generous. Especially when you're talking about people that, I mean, there's a lot of people might have a shingle, but that's because they know that, oh, there's an opportunity to mm -hmm. get more revenue. Ooh, but yeah. again, if they're not, they're not a power user, they don't really understand yeah. it. People yeah. figure this out quick, by the way. Mm -hmm. People are in crypto. Mm -hmm. They talk to you in five minutes. They know whether you know what you're talking about that's or not. That's true. So. That's very true. Um, yeah, right here and then right there. Yep. So That, that is one way to follow up on the question of how to find an accountant. You can also go, every state has an accountancy board. That accountancy board will have a list of all the folks, what their specialty is. Find somebody you have a good relationship with and then say, hey, for the crypto piece of my life, this guy will take care of it. And then, then you'll have two sets of eyes to look at it, right? You have two sets of eyes. Um, because I really like that. I get to do the part I like, right? I get to do the crypto piece, right? And I get to have a cool conversation with the accountant. You know, it's also always a good relationship. Oftentimes, it brings me even more business, right? Maybe I'm a little selfish in that. But that's usually a good way to do it. Find somebody you've got a good relationship with. Connect me. Sometimes, like, the software has directories. There are, uh, you know, crypto accountant-specific directories. So there's mm -hmm. just lots of different ways. Yeah. So. Ask a, fr ask a friend is another good way. Um, most, a lot of business for accountants comes from referrals of current clients. If your friend has an accountant that they like, that's usually a good way to find somebody who's yeah, going to take care of Ask your crypto friend, your DGEN friend. Yeah. How are you solving this? And then right there, you had one too? <laughs> Push the risk off to you, the client. There we go. Here, you sign this for me. Yeah, that's yeah, that, that's a that's a good point. That is a good point. However, uh, I think it's like I always look at I like to always look at everything on a spectrum, mm -hmm. and so a crypto tax complexity is on a, is on a, or just crypto complexity in general is on a spectrum. Yeah. So newbie on one end of the spectrum, super comp degen way on the other side, and so you start off you can start off really simple, on one end of the spectrum, but I think you can quickly, a couple steps quickly. later, it's also it's complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And, and so, the, like I said, then you get into you got to really understand the nuances of what's going on with the software and stuff. So people yeah. think that they're, you know, it's not it's not a magic wand. I don't think no. software is a magic wand. Not like at the, all. Like the, you know, put your stuff, put, put, add all your exchanges in ten minutes and get your crypto taxes done. That's a great marketing thing, but that's not really how I see it is in practice. You need somebody who really can can find out where there's issues. We had this one client that came and he had his gains were four hundred and like. Four hundred fifty thousand dollars, and he's like, "I knew that wasn't right, but I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't pinpoint it." All and day. by the time we got that, it was like one hundred twenty-five thousand yeah. dollars. And he had All some day. rogue transaction, and he didn't know how to solve it. And it was a lot of work. It was, it was messed up because it was like we couldn't get the data from certain places. It was inside of a game, couldn't get Ooh. the data out. This, that, and the other. But anyway, 
if he if he'd have just gone like on that, oh well, I guess I'd you know. That's the thing. I guess I made that and paid a whole bunch of extra. I've seen that. I've seen that happen. I'll come back to you right over here though. Right next to you, and then then we'll go over here. Okay, guess not. Yep, go for it. Do you own all the wallets? Yeah, as long as you own the wallets, it's like moving money from one pocket to another. Yeah. Do you have one right there? That's all right. That's yeah, all right. transfers are not taxable. If you do do that, and just plug in the software, it might misappropriate that. It's like acquiring for the first time it could appropriate. If you don't exactly. have, yeah, that's exactly what'll happen. You gotta, yeah, there's, like I said, to me, soft, the software is not a magic yeah. wand. No, you put the stuff in the software and then we go through all the transactions, right? And then at the end of that, I'm gonna review it with the client and say, does this make sense to you? Nobody knows your portfolio better than you, right? Just because I'm right. good at your yeah. software and I'm a power user yeah, of all you know I'll best. Give you, I'll give you an example where it's series, super simple. So a player uses one exchange. You just pick the exchange, Coinbase or Gemini, that's it. No other wallets, one spot. You plug that one in, now, most likely, that, that could work without the, the account, but as soon as you add the second one, the, again, it's just, I'm generally exponential speaking. Exponential curve. Exponential curve, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right here. Wait, so would the bridging transactions also be included there? Because you would be buying a token. You would be selling the token on the first chain and buying a wrapped version of that token on the second chain. At the same price? At, it's an instantaneous transaction. So even if, it, even if you wanted to, it, if, even if it was a taxable event, it would not produce a tax liability because your basis and your proceeds are the same. Is well, that your thought? Uh, well, I mean, so your, your question is about wrap tokens. Is that what it is? Well, basically bridging is that what you're saying? One chain to another. Oh, bridging. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. right. Because as long as the basis and the proceeds are the same. So a little bit of semantics. <clears throat> a tax, a tax, a reportable event is something that needs to be reported. It's gonna be on the 8949. So a bridging transaction where you went from ETH to wrapped ETH is a reportable event, right? It is also taxable in that should that event produce a result that has a gain or loss, that gain or loss will be calculated in the tax. So it is taxable, right? But it does not produce a tax liability if it's zero and if the proceeds and the basis are the same. So just a little bit of kind of syntax right there to kind of understand the difference. It's yeah, I mean you talk if you talk about bridging and then you talk about like Robtech is like I mean there's 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 a lot of this more complex stuff where we don't have clarity. Yeah. And it, we, and, and and it might be a while because every, now that the, I mean we're not at the end of all possible trans all possible crazy stuff in crypto. Yeah. There's going to be new stuff that comes about that we don't even have yet. But anyway, even in but, my answer to your question, I skipped over the question about wrapped tokens because is it the same asset? You could argue it's the same asset. And you could argue that it's that not. It's not. And you that's right. could make a good that's, argument. That's, that's, that's why I was going with it, exactly. Yeah. And so is it a reportable if if it is if it's the same asset, then it's not even reportable. Right? Yeah, it's just it's a, it's just like uh, like a well, I say swap, moving it from one pocket like, to another. But yeah, it's just like exactly. Yeah. Right? But there is there is a case that's called uh, there's a cottage, cottage savings case. You could look up the wiki on mm -hmm. it, and uh, so in that case, it was something similar where the they were trading. I think it was like mortgage-backed securities or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was basically they, uh, I guess, cottage savings was saying, "Oh, this was it was the equivalent of a bridge transaction, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. in, but in the legacy world." Right, right. And they lost the court case because it said, "Oh no, it's the it's the rights and obligations. How is it different?" So that's the thing. We don't know about this yet. We're kind of yeah. getting into the weeds. Right. But if a wrap token gives you different rights and stuff like that. Rights, responsibility, Then they can say, oh, that's yeah. a different asset. Mm -hmm. Even though it might seem to us, oh, no, it's just a wrap version. It's the same price, right? Mm -hmm. You look at BTC, WBTC. I mean, they're not always the same price, but yeah. essentially, essentially they are. Yeah. Yeah. In theory. That's a good question, though. So there's still clarity to be had there. Eric? Starting basis for 
Yeah. Are we talking about think, impermanent loss here? Is that what we're talking about? No, I, I think, I think you, talk, you talk about like a rebasing scenario. Is yeah, that what you mean? There's kind of a way to that, but it's, it's more like a dividend cycle you get every time someone else doesn't buy your sale. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I mean. I but mean, then your, but it, then your principal is changing also, it sounds like. It is. Yeah. So that sounds like, and it's going down, right? Well, now it sounds well, like this, income. I, what, what I'm hearing you describe sounds less like rebasing, because if you're saying you're getting dividends, again, it's just another yeah, it's just income another stream. It's income. another, whether it's LP token rewards or whatever, it's. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I really need to ask, in a situation like that, would you have an asset that you can just sell for CFU, uh, maybe take a lower mm -hmm. and then sell? What's putting something like that into a Roth IRA look like? Ooh, that might work for you, for a young That's person. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, any tax deferred vehicle is gonna. You're not gonna have any of these situations. You're mm -hmm. not gonna have it. Actually, actually, if you could set one of those up, the benefit is you don't have any of these tax headaches at all. Yeah, you don't even need to come here and talk to you us. You can knock yourself shame, out and <laughs> trade <laughs> trade to your heart's content. If it's inside of a Roth, then you're gonna get. You can have a whole business inside of your IRA if you want to. I mean, if, if that's what you, you can have a whole business inside of Yeah, if it's IRA in a tax itself. deferred vehicle, it, do, it doesn't, all these other nuances don't matter. It's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's gonna, I mean, you've, you've gotta find a custodian for a Roth. It's gonna though, be, right? it's gonna be whenever the tax is normally triggered. Like, mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, in the Roth, it's, you've already paid the tax up front, right? Yeah. And then in the other one, the I end. mean, it's just, it's just, and then in the traditional, you're gonna mm -hmm. take a deduction, so you're gonna pay tax on the back end. But meanwhile, whatever happens in between, doesn't really matter. It's all gravy. So I think what we learned here is that there's pros out there that you should really rely on. I'd love to give it up one more time for the coolest two accountants I've ever had. That's my man. Woo. That was really uh, enlightening. Um, we could probably kill all the tech and continue talking. I want to be respectful of the time, but fan fascinating, right? So for all of us. Um, this was our last uh, finance uh, track talk of the day. We'll pick it up tomorrow. We're going to be in the kiosk room for all financial um, track uh, sessions is my understanding tomorrow. Um, once again, my name is Kevin May. I'm with the uh, Bush School of Business at the Catholic University of America. Feel free to uh, chat with our speakers, chat with myself. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Just want to give one more thank you to our uh, founding sponsors, Ave Maria University, uh, Crescite, uh, Solidarity HealthShare, and the Visiting Angels Home Healthcare. And again, let's just give it up one more time. That was really fantastic. Thank you so much.